I don't know if uh, you guys can retrieve it, but I just barely emailed you a copy of the Kenworth contract. I just tracked it down. Oh, okay. no, I can't. I'd have to get out of the meeting to get it. So okay. we'll, well, we'll rely on your interpretation of the contract, Dorinda. Okay. Good work finding it. Yep. So I think, I believe, uh, the gang is all here and it's five o'clock. So I'm going to uh, call the meeting to order, uh, noting that uh, Steve is absent. Other members of the select board are here. We have Lowry with us, keeping an eye on us. We have Vic, we have Dorinda, and we have Sarah. Welcome everybody. Um, Sky Barsh. Yes, I'm sorry, Sky. I'm looking right at you and I didn't say your name. I apologize. Welcome. Um, so first up on the agenda is reviewing and approving the capital spending plan process. Action possible. Liz, you're gonna kick that off. Peter did. Sure. Um, so I sent it, and frankly, I don't remember getting it from Sarah, but Sarah, did you send it out to everybody, that whole link and everything? I had put everything into PDF. Okay. Yep. Um, I did. did everybody get a chance to read all those wonderful pages that we sent along? Yeah. Um, so basically, um, as you know, we've been doing this process for the last year, um, and uh, it's now ready to become sort of a, an adopted document that is a um, fluid document, meaning that it, can, it will change over time as, as things get added to it. Um, but this is sort of the, the final um, draft, so to speak, um, of this document. And it just made sense to us. I don't, I don't think it's actually technically required, but it just made sense to us that we would have the select board um, officially um, adopt the, so basically it's the procedure as to how to um, participate, you know, in a capital uh, spending plan if you wanted to apply for it, um, as well as the, some of the documents that sort of outlined the history and why we did it. And then the actual spreadsheet itself, which I think I sent you guys the link to that, not just because it was too hard to put that into a PDF. Um, that's a document that is in right now, a Google Drive, all of it. Um, and Elias and I are um, sort of right now, we're the ones with um, editing capabilities. Um, but we also think that perhaps Randy should have editing capabilities since he's going to be on the budget committee as well as the select board. Um, and I guess, you know, if anyone has any questions um, about it. I can try to answer them. So just just to remind everybody, this was the result um, of us getting a firm nudge at our last in-person town meeting saying, hey, you know, you guys come to us, you say it's time for a new truck, you come to us to say it's time for a new grader, you do this and that. We wanna know what we're looking at ahead of us and we wanna have a plan to deal with it. So. This is, this is our best effort to create a document and a process where on the Middlesex website, this document will exist and anyone anytime will be able to go in and look at it. They won't be able to change it, but they'll be in and look at it. And if they have comments or concerns or whatever, they can, uh, they can reach out. Um, at first, it seems a little cumbersome and unwieldy. But for me, the more we got into it and the more we understood the process with Christian's help, uh, the more straightforward it seems. It does put a significant additional burden on the budget committee in particular because they're going to be, they're going to be managing this process. Right, but it's not, you know, so in terms of, you know, extra work, yes, it is extra work. Um, but I also, what I like about it is that, you know, we've spent many a meeting <laughs> saying, which truck is that that we put a new engine in that was this old engine, <laughs> right? And, and we forget every time, right? And I think that this document will also help with that because we have notes next to things like when something was done, um, 
or something, you know, significant about that particular, you know, purchase or, or um, thing that, you know, we, we upgraded um, is in this document. So I think that it will be helpful for, for that reason as well. Plus, it also gives a process by which if you were a member of the town, and this is, you know, outside of, say, the road crew, um, but like if the fire department wants to purchase something big, you know, there's a process by which they do it. There's an application that they fill out. If there's someone in the town who says, you know, I want to, um, you know, perhaps, you know, buy something like, I don't know what, for the bandstand, right? And we'd like the town to pay for it. This is a possibility to, again, it has to be $5,000 or more. Um, so it's not just piddly stuff that people apply for. It's, it's, it's bigger ticket items and they have to be assets. So it's not like people, it's not, it's not um, employment. It's not that kind of thing. It's, it's really around um, uh, town assets that considered are considered structures. Um, things like, um, say it costs thousands of dollars to do something like get signage for, um, our land or something like that, or build mountain bike trails, something like that, right? That could be considered a, I would think a, ca a potential capital expenditure, um, even though it's not necessarily an object because our land is included in, in the capital spending plan. Um, so anyway, it's a start, and um, and right now it just has kind of all the things that we already were identified as 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 um, assets for buildings and trucks and equipment, um, and uh, and it, this is what has then prompted us to take the next step to do a planning study on the town hall. So actually, doing this process has sort of given us some leverage for getting more grant money as well. So, so I think that, this, you know, really what we want to do is vote on whether or not we um, are accepting this document um, as the official capital improvement plan. Well, and accepting the process. And, and the, the process, right. Yes, Phil. Yeah, um, first of all, I'd just like to say um, that Liz, you particularly, and uh, all the other people who worked on this, I think did a great job. Um, it's a lot to digest. I've only been through it one time. Um, but, you know, again, like uh, you were talking about the town hall and some of the, the costs associated with uh, maintaining the town hall jumped out, um, you know, really quickly. So, uh, I agree. I think it's a, a great document to inform um, our planning, our budgeting, uh, our spending, I guess, too. Um, so um, thanks uh, to everyone for doing that. And uh, I'll certainly make the motion that the board uh, accept the um, capital, cap what are we, capital improvement budget? Yeah, CIP is what it's called, a, a capital improvement Program. Really Program is what it is. Plan. Okay. Yeah. Is there a second to Phil's motion? I would second that. Thank you, Randy. <clears throat> uh, any further? Uh, any further discussion? I, I would just say uh, one last thing, which is the first time we really use this document, which is going to be this year, uh, we may make changes. I I look forward to fleshing it out and having it contain more information. And over time, it will show historically what we've done but it will show prospectively what we plan to do so mm -hmm. i think it's gonna be I think and i just want to say to dorinda that i believe i'm and i maybe i need to talk offline with you about this dorinda i'm not sure but so this grant has a match and i'm not sure how that sort of flushes out in the end but like i know that i need to submit my final grant report and so i don't know if we actually i don't know how that works with the match but it was like 900 dollars or something yeah, I, I can um, get you the figures. Uh, I think all the bills have now been paid with the last bill that came in. So I can get you what we um, have paid out and then you should be able to find, you know, do the final report from there. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So I think that they maybe take off the fine, like the match. I'm not sure how that works. So like, how do, how do they get, how does the match get accounted for? 
I think the way it's been working is if we, if it was a 20% match or whatever the match was, if we sent them a bill for a hundred, they reimbursed us 80. I see. Okay. I think that's how it worked. I have to look at the checks that have come in. I, I don't memorize them. <laughs> so okay. I'll have to look at, we have a log sheet for all the grants. So. Okay. Yeah. And I've kept all the copies of the, um, invoices yeah. and stuff so anyway i believe that grant report is due in may but i i'll just start working on it now i don't think there's any reason to to wait yeah. um, but i'll, I'll have keep... to look at it again okay i can get it to you if not this week by next week I'll okay have it to that's you. fine cool yep. all right thank you okay, so it, so it has been moved and seconded uh to adopt our capital what what is it cpi cip cip i'm sorry plan. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We've adopted it. Here we go. Woohoo! Thanks, everybody. And I, I do need to give credit. Really, all the credit is due to Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, who pulled the whole thing together and did all the work. So thank you, Phil, for giving me credit. But really, <laughs> you don't get you don't need to give me any credit. <laughs> Christian hey, from C CVRP with uh, Central Regional Planning Commission was well, great. Whatever credit you can get, Liz. <laughs> yeah. So um, now, now that this is approved, we just had a budget meeting uh, prior to this, and um, oh. we we plan to um, reach out to all the committee heads and kind of uh, remind them that the form you know, is expected to be completed for like April one, if possible, um, so that we can start this process. But uh, the budget committee is is excited about moving forward with this. And we think it's going to be uh, a great asset to the town. Oh, good. Thank you, Randy, I would, I would just suggest you give everybody a little bit of slack this year because April 1st is practically tomorrow, as you may know. That's, that's what we said. <laughs> okay, yes, Sarah. When you say the form, you mean this is the form in the in the document where you're adding asking? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And also, um, I don't know, Randy, if you're going to be able to attend, but Elias and I have signed up for some workshops that are specifically on the capital improvement planning process for, uh, through the League of Cities and Towns, maybe, or something like that. It's a two-day workshop um, yeah. or like an eight-hour workshop over two days with, with like three different topics. And so Randy, if you're able to go, it'd be great for us to each take three different topics and then. Um... Uh, yeah, we discussed that in the budget committee as well. Um, there, there's probably some interest on Theo and Mark's uh, part oh, perfect. as well. So um, we were going to, I was going to circulate that information to those folks as well. And um, okay. that way we can all come, come up to speed at, at together. Great. Okay. Next on the hit list, discussing USDA Rural Energy Pilot Program Grant for Community Energy Efficiency and Weatherization. Larry Scharf of the Energy Committee is to attend Action Possible. You are on, sir. Good evening. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm not sure if Theo is here in capacity as an Energy Committee member, but he can certainly chime in. Um, so I wanted to talk about something that we're just kind of just looking at for the first time, which is this grant opportunity, and just wanted to uh, put it out there and see if there was any synergy on this. And um, so this is a very much of a unbaked idea, but since I know that there's, you know, work on, with the capital improvement process to potentially improve the town buildings, which in, could involve weatherization, this, grant could potentially help fund that. So um, is it okay if I share my screen? Because I made a few slides. Yeah. All right. Ask me to do something that's technically beyond my capability. No, no, no. I'm, I'm about to um, share my screen. Um, so as you may remember, um, yeah. town meeting day, not so long ago, uh, there was the item on the ballot to approve the energy plan, and that passed, the enhanced energy plan. And, um, and that includes a whole bunch of stuff that talks about renewable energy. So this grant from USDA would, would help fund renewable energy in our town. And so it's, it's geared towards rural areas, 
So we, we hit that one. Um, let me go to the next slide. Um, so here's the, the quick and dirty purpose to support the nation's critical energy needs, combating climate change while advancing environmental justice, racial equity, and economic opportunity with distributed energy technologies. And distributed energy technologies means community uh, solar or community wind where a bunch of entities, not just individuals, but not just one individual, but could be multiple homeowners, could be the town, would join together to invest or participate in a solar project or a wind project and then get the energy from that. So um, that's, the, that's the nuts and bolts of it. They are targeting, as it says, you know, environmental justice, racial equity, and economic opportunity. And so the, the people that they want to serve with this money are, uh, you know, under, underprivileged communities, which includes um, the, the, you know, people of lower income. So just because we're a very white state doesn't mean we're disqualified. Um, the dollars, so the, it's a pilot program, so there's not a lot. There's a national thing, so $10 million nationally. You know, I don't know what the chances are of us getting money from this, but it pays an 80% match. So we would need to come up with 20%. And we could apply for up to $2 million. Um, and then there are two components to it. I mentioned weatherization earlier. That can only be up to 20% of the funding. So there has to be a renewable energy component to it that is the 80% of it. Um, so um, the due date for a letter of intent is April 19th, and then the actual application is July 19th. So that's, that's definitely coming up. So like I said, this is a new idea. This is just one grant. I just wanted to put it out there. Um, I'm going to be looking for other grant opportunities. So I'm not sure if we're going to, you know, find all the the pieces to pull this off. Um, but since we're, you know, we're we're past the vote on the enhanced energy plan and it passed, you know, we want to start we're looking at more serious um, endeavors as as a committee and as a town. So I, I don't necessarily expect any kind of an answer, but um, if there is anything already on your minds that aligns with this, I'd love to hear about it. So what are you, is this just giving us information on something that might happen or you're, you're asking us for authority to go ahead at this point in time? Uh, we're gonna discuss it further next week. We're gonna meet as an energy committee and look at it and talk about what, what we think is feasible. I just wanted to hear if you have been hearing of other similar efforts in Middlesex that, around renewable energy um, or have any, any thoughts yourselves about renewable energy in Middlesex for or against. Comments, anyone? I have a question. Is there, I mean, to me, the likelihood of Middlesex getting a, a grant of that capacity when there's only $10 million and we're not a disadvantaged community is very unlikely. And I probably wouldn't even spend time writing the grant for it because of that. Mm -hmm. Is there any opportunity for this? Have you looked at the grant to see if there's you know, a multi-town aspect of it that you know you could include like Worcester, for example, which may be a lower income community, um, you know, to get more of a mass application as opposed to, because I can, I mean, pretty much if anyone's written a federal grant, Middlesex isn't going to get this, but they could if it was done maybe in central Vermont or there was some community solar array that, that impacted more towns. Uh, does it say anything about that, like communities versus towns? Yeah, it, it, it says it, it, it does look for partnerships amongst entities 
So it can be, it could be multi-channel. So that's a that's an interesting idea. Theo, do you want to? Can I ask the question? I, I don't want to get out ahead of the like board. Yeah, is, is there any downside? Because I want to look deeply with you at the Energy Committee, but is there a downside to submitting a letter of intent uh, on the 14th of April if we think that there's even a chance for this? And do we need the select board's approval to do so? I don't see a downside, but I don't know about the approval. Does it require that a, a town partner somehow to... It requires a partner that is an established you know, entity, whether it's a nonprofit or a municipality or some government entity. Mm -hmm. Does so, it yeah. say in the letter of intent that the town has to have already agreed to the match for the entity? Um, that's a good question, I'm not sure. I mean, because, you know, the, the thing about the match is that a 20% match is big, right? Especially for two, mm -hmm. if, if even if you apply for 2 million, I mean, even if you apply for 100,000, that's still bigger than like what is in our budget. And so that, I think, you know, for a thing at this scale, you know, you'd be really looking at um, the, the upper end of an application um, for something like a town-wide array and, you know, the town, I'm just, you know, wondering if the, if you've looked into what the 20% match could be. Like, I think actually, so this was actually goes back to um, uh, the ARPA funds that we have. Uh, Randy, was it you? <laughs> we had this conversation. What can the ARPA funds be used to match for? Other well, federal grants or not? They're... There are inclusions for other federal grants, but they have to be allowable by that grant, which, so I did a little bit of digging on this in the ha a half hour or so when it got added to the agenda. And it does look like um, this pilot program would allow, if your other money's allowed, um, the federal dollars to be used as the grant match. So it looks like at first glance that the ARPA money could potentially be used towards that 20% match. Um, we'd have to dig into it more, but knee jerk reaction. It looks like it may be possible. Well, I guess, I guess what I would say, Larry is um, you're going to have, you're going to have a meeting. We're going to meet, uh, the first Tuesday in April, whatever that whatever that date is, but it's coming right up. Um, why don't you get back to us then, and then we can decide what, if anything, the town needs to do to go forward with this. If in fact you're thinking you should go for it, okay, it's great. A little premature right now to for the town to say, yeah, we're right. doing this when we don't even really know what it is yet. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. Just just wanted to get the ball rolling and I appreciate uh, the feedback and I'll, I'll inquire about matching funds and municipal other municipalities being involved. Yeah. So and Larry, I, and I and just say what, what Liz said is let's be, we have, as a town, we have a lot of grant opportunities looking at us. So if there's just a remote chance that we might get this, I would say, let's, let's save our powder for working on something that's more likely. If there's, some kind of chance that we could get it and it doesn't take a huge amount of time, then fine. Right, right. You know, okay. and one tiny additional, oh, sorry, go ahead, man. I, I was just gonna say that it, I would be interested to hear like what kind of brainstorming guys are, like what kind of ideas are, are you guys looking at? And I know, I know you don't have anything in mind right now, but with 80% of that be, having to be dedicated to you know, renewable distribution uh, within town and, and whatnot, I'd be, I'd be interested in what kind of ideas are actually out there that, that are feasible. Mm -hmm. so. Yep, makes sense. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll look forward to hearing back from you. Okay. Okay, next on the list is reviewing a revised policy for town access to Rumney School, action likely. 
Mr. McVeigh does not seem to be here. We might have to pass over it. Unless, I mean, I sent it to you, but. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's urgent. I would, I would, uh, I would prefer to pass over it until Chris is here. I, okay. I read the new document, the one and a half pages, but I didn't go back and compare it to the old document and really see what the changes are. But it did appear to me that the serious change, um, the two serious changes were in, were in one and two on the first, sub one and sub two on the first page, where it says, the request is deemed to be improved unless there's a conflict. That is exactly what we talked about when we reviewed this the last time. And then the other piece of it was, to the extent any building use form of policy or other application conflicts with the terms of the easement, the easement terms control. So that I think was giving us what we were looking for, but I agree unless, unless anybody has anything more on this tonight that we pass over it until we can have Chris join the join the meeting. Is that okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. Yep. He's the, uh, he's the expert on this for sure. Oh, and here's, here's another one of everybody's favorites. Considering the possible options to address wandering farm animals on Brook Road action likely. I don't know what kind of action is likely unless, unless, uh, unless we can appoint Steve as the farm animal control officer in his absence and send him up there to take care of this problem. Yes, Sarah. Okay, so uh, Dorinda gets the credit here uh, for digging recording out, in progress. Sorry, the digging out the quote unquote public safety statute um, regarding the select board's ability to fine uh, ten dollars per offense for wandering uh, swine, cattle, swine. I had it right here. Um, I think I sent it to you as well, and uh, that would. I've talked to uh, that the, uh, as wandering swine, cattle, ducks, geese, whatever, that is not approved by the select board. So I guess the select board could theoretically approve wandering cattle. But anyway, if you don't approve wandering cattle, you could uh, notify the homeowner who is letting these cattle wander about. And I just received a fresh complaint today from a neighbor. Um, and, and finer, I did talk to Lee Youngman up at, uh, in, in Orange, who's dealt with wandering pigs. And that was a big pig problem. I think maybe you remember that. And that ended up in court and every single charge was, every single offense was thrown out, all the $10 fines because the process wasn't followed correctly. So her only warning was, if you do this, just make sure you check with your town attorney to make sure that due process is followed. So this effort is not done. So. We're just tell. I'm just bringing this up tonight because we've. Re I know you guys have talked about this in the past, and there have been concerns all over the place, including from neighbors. And here you go. I can give you the citation in two seconds. So, so I I believe I read that same. Uh, I did too. Same piece. Um, the the problem with that is we have to march through the process, and it's not a simple process. And she's going to kick and fight and spit and you know who knows what's going to happen i i don't know i mean if we if if that's the only action available to us i guess we have to decide if we're willing to do it or not i went by today and that cute little calf was sitting with his head right in the road fast asleep with a goose lying next to him <laughs> i mean it's 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 bad it's bad but I don't know how others others feel. I'm I'm reluctant to start issuing tickets. You know, we've we we've come right to the brink a few times with our with our junk ordinance about issuing tickets, and we've always pulled back in the end because we were we were scared to do it. So I'm just saying, and it's been a long time since I've looked at the whole process, but it's it is not a simple uh, process. And who's going to yes. do it? We don't have a sheriff, so it's going to be the select board that issues the ticket, I presume. Mm -hmm. Is our um, roadway considered a public highway? Yep. Yes. Okay. How come, so if that's in the statute, how come Callis had such a hard time, maybe because it was only $10, with the, with the woman with the horses, and they had to adopt something in their select board to deal with the, the horses from the, um, that woman? named Elizabeth, who would run her, who would walk her horses everywhere and everyone complained, but there was nothing they could do. 
Yes, sir. Yeah. I think this is what we're talking about, about the process. That's what Orange didn't do. And I guess that's what Callis did have to do was adopt something. I mean, I can, if you guys are interested in it, I can, I can send this off to Rob and say, what exactly do you have to do? Cause it's not entirely clear in the statute, but I would, I mean, I would assume it starts off with just a letter to, uh, to Carol saying, look at, we have this, you know, the, the board has this authority and, and we are going to do it. But I mean, again, that, probably be best to check with a lawyer first to see what how lengthy the process is don't we have to I, when i was when i was looking at this two or three weeks ago i mm -hmm. believe we have to adopt i guess the right word is an ordinance saying you know you cannot have wild farm animals running in the road and then we have to enforce our ordinance yes dorinda i would say it'd be no different than the dog ordinance sort of thing um, you would have to adopt an ordinance that meets that statute that they can't be in the roadway or whatever, or they would be fined. And then just like with our dog ordinance, you have hearings. And then once that's followed through after so many warnings, they get the animal. I mean, the dogs would have to go away if, from when I sat on the board. And I find it very similar to that situation. Right, I believe we do have, I mean, so there you go. We do have the authority to take the animals, potentially. But, you know, what do we do then? Where we'll do we just get them more. take some? You know, I, I mean, I'm just. <laughs> uh, I, this is, I mean, this is, in this sub, the, I'm just reading this again. It's just, I'm not sure you have to have an ordinance. It just says a person who knowingly, it's right there in the state statutes, you know, a, you, who, if you knowingly permit cattle, horses, sheep, goats, or swine to run at large in a public highway or yard belonging to a public without building, without consent of the select board, shall be fined no more than 10, no less than $3. Yeah, but isn't that the way the dog thing reads and we have to do a dog ordinance? I, I don't know, Sarah. I mean, I, I guess the answer is for me, I think we should at least look into this and understand what we're up against if we're going to go forward with this, rather than just kick right. it around and say how frustrating it is. So I would say, for me, I would say, yes, let's look into it and find what the process is, see how unwieldy it is, and then we can make a decision if we want to go forward. Does that make sense? Is, um, I have a question. Is Erica still our animal control officer? Yes. I'm wondering if it would make sense for Erica to just make a little friendly visit. <laughs> she's she's, she's done, done it before. Yeah. yeah. What? She has you done don't it agree before, that? yes, with little success, I would say. I don't I don't know. Let's 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 take a look at what the at what the whole process is and then make a decision how we're gonna go forward. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm not, I'm not against having, having Erica go down there, but I don't think it's going to do any more good than my, my visit, which started out friendly and ended up nasty. So I won't do it and you can't make me. That's Carol's position. This is under the uh, cruelty to animal statute as well, so. Right. Yes, Vic. You're muted. You're muted, Vic. But the, the one in orange is, uh, that was when they had the wild, the pigs roaming around. Yeah. Yes. Didn't the uh, fish and wildlife get into that and told them they were either going to start, they were either going to keep their pigs in or they were going to uh, destroy them? I mean, I don't know how many pigs she has. I don't know if she has uh, Vietnamese pigs or regular pigs or what she has, but... Uh, Fish and wife, wildlife doesn't look fondly upon uh, pigs turning wild because they, uh, they uh, reproduce rapidly and they tear up a lot of, uh, of uh, the environment. They're pretty rough on uh, everything. Well, I don't, I don't think these, from my observation, <laughs> these animals aren't very threatening except they're wandering around in the road. I don't think they're, I, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. I, I think we just have to ask Sarah to do a little more research into this and uh, and maybe consult with Erica and put our heads together and see uh, what the next step is. But we have never we have never in the history that I can recall and 
Dorinda, I think you would agree with me. We've never fined anybody for anything in town. So this would be a big step for us. Peter. Yes. Do, does the board mind if I contact Fish and Wildlife and see what the scoop is on it? Or? Go right ahead, Greg. Yeah. She doesn't have pigs, Vic. Just be aware the pigs are gone. Mm. The pigs are gone? I believe they're all, I don't think there's a pig involved I, anymore. Right. I think it's just um, cows and um, the fowl, you know, like geese and that type of thing. Yeah, it's, okay. geese, it's geese, ducks, a few chickens, two, I would say, full size cows and one calf, from my observation. And I think the statute pertains to cows, horses, pigs, et cetera. Uh, I don't believe it includes geese and chickens, and but anyway, mm -hmm. let's find out. Again, my my fear in this, and I'm I'm an animal lover, so I hate to see the animals mistreated and get hurt. But at the same time, I'm afraid somebody's going to come around the corner at not necessarily a high rate of speed, and have to dodge one of these animals and end up you know, hitting a tree or hitting another car or who knows what, and somebody gets hurt. So, yes, Sandy. Um, can I just say, I drive by there occasionally. I'm, from my perspective, this is Sandy Levine. This is a rural community. I think it's no different than dogs being on the road. And that's part of living in a rural community. And has anybody had a complaint other than having to slow down to avoid hitting them? And if that's all you have to do, that's not a problem. And I think you're, from my perspective, I think you're looking for a problem that is just life in a rural community. But that's just my opinion. So the only thing I say about that is that the other side of this is, I think, I don't know, I think there's a health violation there. I mean, she was, she was living with that calf in her house. Does that meet the sniff test? I mean, it's one thing to be a rural community. It's another thing to have the animals living in your house with you. I don't that's, know. That's a different issue. What I hear you talking about is the cow in the road. And I've seen chickens in the road. I mean, elsewhere in town. And, you know, I, I it's. I, I don't see that, you know, them wandering in the road is any different than me walking down the road and making people slow down so they don't hit me or somebody with their dog walking along on the side of the road and people having to slow down so they don't hit that. I hear you. We've had an awful lot of complaints. I, I guess let's, my, let's, my, let's, my let's, question is, only, are the complaints only about having to slow down? And then I think one should you know, inquire, is that such a big problem? I don't, yes, Sarah. Uh, one of the complaints is from a neighbor uh, who understands that this is a neighbor versus neighbor issue, not a neighbor versus town issue when the animal comes into his property. But he is, uh, this this animal, because, this, because he's got a a water feature, let's put it that way. This animal is getting into the water, it's, it's icy, he's worried about this animal getting stuck. And uh, he does not want to confront Carol directly. And I said to him, this is not when, it, when you're, you know, the roads are one thing, but he, the animal going into your private property is no different than a dog going into your private property. It's suddenly not, that is not a town issue anymore. That is simply a, uh, a homeowner versus homeowner thing, which nobody likes to deal with, including the Right. But, the, but no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, the Brett's cows used to come into our property. He would just let them go crazy and they'd be all over the road and everything like that. And they would destroy your property. Like they destroy your lawn, they destroy your fields. And it, it, if there's a law that people are supposed to keep their animals in the fence, I, are you saying that if it comes on your property, that becomes, it's still a um, neighbor to neighbor conflict, even if they're breaking the law, the town well, somehow doesn't have to get involved. If you, you know, the, the, and Sandy's a lawyer here, so she probably understands this a lot better than I do, but just for my training on animal control, which has taken up a large part of the town clerk training, when, when, in, when in, uh, in, in, for example, in this statute, it's only when it's only applies when the animal is at large in a public highway or a yard belonging to a public building. 
without the consent of the select board. So it does not address private homeowner versus homeowner things. In that case, you're back to a, you know, what is it? A private rate of action or whatever. And suddenly the town is out of it. <laughs> Sandy, was that the right yeah. term? Again, looking looking at what we yeah, want no. to do here, I would I would suggest that we have Sarah look into this further, and then we can uh, discuss it some more. I I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, Sandy. I I just think this is this is different from a from a, a farmer's cow or horse who get out once in a while, and the farmer runs around and captures them and brings it back. This is this is uh, I I just feel like it's different, but maybe I'm wrong. So, select board, are we agreeing to have have Sarah go ahead and look into this? Does that make sense, Randy? You agree? Yeah, I'd Blake. like to know more about it. I guess to, to understand what what the process would even look like to if we did want to take any action. The only other thing I think I would have to say is I know you've had a conversation with her, Peter. You know, kind of like stopping by, and and maybe Victor has too. I don't I don't know in the past, but. Do we feel like it would be worth to, you know, reaching out to her and say, hey, can can we sit down and talk about this a little bit? Um, I don't know if that would go anywhere, but I mean, you know, the the answer is the answer is who knows. Steve has been involved with her for a long time. He's tried to help her. He's given her food, feed for the animals. He's done all kinds of stuff. He's tried to help her. You know, he helped her move her fence back, which was in the which was in the, the town right away. I mean. There, there have been a lot of people involved in this, and you know when I when I stopped and talked to her, I started out being very gent gentle with her, just saying you know, people in town, myself included, are include are worried about the safety of your animals and you know the safety of the people using the the town highway, and you know we're not necessarily looking for trouble, but we're looking for you to keep your animals in a safe in a safe uh, manner and she has taken some steps i mean she built that bridge across the river which i think is probably an illegal bridge but she has a pasture mm -hmm. a fenced in pasture on the other side of the uh, other side of the river if the cows were in that pasture they'd be fine why do they need to be in her front yard right in the with their noses in the town <laughs> right away but she just she just immediately got nasty and said you have no authority to get involved in this. The town has no power to do anything about it. And she said some other unpleasant four letter words to me as I was, uh, as I was leaving. So she was the one who escalated the situation, not me. No, I, I wasn't, I wasn't meaning that if that's the way it came off. Um, the other question that I would have is, is this isolated to a winter, um, a, a seasonal, um, thing? Do we get the same kind of complaints during the summertime? I would say it's year round. My observation is it's year round. They seem to have increased lately. Okay. Well, the, the, My biggest perspective. Legal, the biggest legal offender now is the cat. She does seem to have the the full grown cows fenced in, but but the calf literally sits there right on the edge of the road. Not causing anybody any harm, Sandy, I, I admit, but when he's out wandering around in the road, he potentially causes people harm. So let's let's enough for tonight. Yeah. Um Sarah, see what else, see what else you can uh you can dig up and we'll make some kind of a some kind of decision about this. Okay. Thank you. Um Treasurer's report, update on town finances, action possible, Dorinda. Um I only have, I have a couple things. I got a bill in from business radio licensing and it's for, a, and I don't know if this is really, if this is spam or not, but it came pre-filled out with all of our information and it looks like it's an FCC license renewal application for uh, a tower maybe because it's 160 feet in ground elevation. The antenna height is 14 feet, the structure height seven feet. Um, and it renewed, it looked like it was issued in 2013 and it expires um, 
in for 2023 and it has a frequency and everything on it and i just have never seen this before i don't recall sarah are you familiar with it yep you are yes okay and i believe it has to do with the fire department it has to do with the fire we department. have the we have the we have the stuff uh, we have the uh, notice of it hanging over the public computer downstairs okay also, it, it maybe even allows the road crew to talk i don't know I, I didn't know. It's the first I've ever seen of it. And I just, I mean, it looked legit, but. Um, They've changed hands in the, since 2013, I think, the company. So we don't have any record of that company. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Then I will ask, should I ask the fire department about this? Yeah, okay. I'll try to figure out. Do they have a, do they have a big antenna on their uh you know, all I, know, all I know is that when I first got this job in 2013, uh, that was a mystery to me too. And I had to drag it, try to, you know, nail it down what that thing was. But I think that's my recollection. That's what it was used for. It was used for either the fire department or the road crew, or maybe even both. Okay. All right. Um, okay. We'll look into that further then. Um, the other thing I have, which interestingly enough, um, the day after, after our last select board meeting, I received a phone call from Carl Baylin. As did um, I. For Welch Park. Oh, did you? Because I gave him your phone number and he <laughs> didn't sound like he was going to call you. So, um, so, okay, well then if you've talked to him, maybe you want to talk on it <laughs> rather than oh, me. Well, I have, a, I have what, I, what I think is an update on the, on the Welch Park situation. So, um, after our last board meeting, um, I called Rob Halper and said, Rob, we had a conversation almost a year ago, and you were going to get together with John Riley, who's the attorney for Welch Park, and figure out how to A, either get the town out of Welch Park, or B, do away with the Welch Park Association altogether. Uh, and no sooner did I get off the phone with him saying, apologizing and promising that he would get a hold of John and they would get back to me at ASAP. Uh, then Carl called me and said, basically, I'm sick of this. I think we should spike this thing and do away with the association. So he has come a long way because the last time we went through this, he was feeling like we needed to, we needed to continue the association. So, you know, and he was going to reach out to, uh, to Benderson and try and light a fire under them. So, uh, between all of that, uh, and I will follow, if I don't hear back from Rob in the next few days, I'm going to call him up and say, hey, what's going on? But uh, somehow or other, we're going to get to the bottom of this. I have sort of come around to thinking that the best way to handle this is just do away with the whole, do away with the whole thing and give Benderson the fire pond and whatever else there is there. The trade-off might be that and I'm just thinking out loud that we would that we would take over the maintenance of that road, uh, but maybe not. Maybe there's a maybe there's just an agreement where we have an association which just takes care of that road, which should be simple compared to what we're dealing with now with all the water permits and wastewater permits and everything else. But I will believe me, Dorinda. I will be after all these people. Uh, well, I thought it was a coincidence. One of the things he did ask me was about the maintenance of the road. And I right. told him that was a select board decision, um, not mine. Um, the other thing I mentioned to him that I had a $2,000 insurance bill, he told me not to pay it. Well, I feel that I do have to pay it. Um, I think oh, it expires I tomorrow, uh, expired two days ago. Uh, when I talked to when I talked to him, he had, he said, "You said you had to pay it," and I agreed that we have to. I mean, especially okay. now when we're liable to be tiptoeing through the tulips, we need that directors and officers insurance. We might need it for the first time ever. Who knows? Okay. So right. yeah, um, and we should and we should bill everybody for their for their appropriate oh. care of it. We right. do, we do. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, there are you know. It, 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 it sounds, as we know, it sounds easy, easy to kill this thing. But when you're dealing with state water and wastewater permits and other things, it's, it can be challenging. But there has to be some way to do it. And, 
I think we need to do it. And the idea of, you know, anyway, we need to do it. Okay. I will, I will report back. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to bring you up to speed on that. And that's basically it. Nothing else really happening. Okay. Any questions for Dorinda? Okay. Highway Department, update in town, road conditions and issues. Addressing the Kenworth $5,000 surcharge on the order truck, action like this. And we didn't get a copy of the, uh, or I have not seen it, Dorinda, just because I didn't have a chance to download it, but I do have a copy of the, of the notice, which I think okay. all of us have the notice. Well, on the contract, which I, like I said, I just was able to locate, we signed the contract on October 21st. And um, if, you, if you look at the paperwork I just sent over, on the second page, which is on theirs, it says page one of 13. It's a price level April 1, 2021, which means, which I'm bringing that to your attention because in the letter from Kenworth, it mentions April 1, 2022. So I don't know if that would come into play at all. The second thing is in looking back at the minutes, um, it's in our minutes that we were told that this, we, it was confirmed the price is locked in when the order is placed. So I don't wanna start this process all over and that's not what I'm going at, but I don't know, you know, if there's any kind of um, way to adhere to the original contract. So, so the question, and I'd, I'd be glad to stop down and look it over too, but I've been involved, not, not with the town, but with other things where somewhere buried in the purchase contract, it says if there's something like, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, if there are um, increases in cost beyond the, seller's control, those increases can be passed along to the purchaser. And I'm just wondering if there's language in there like that, because they already jumped, they jumped the price once on us when we were, uh, when we were going to sign the contract. Right. That's right. So I'll, I'll just bet you, and I, I don't know what the deal is on the dates, but I'll just bet you buried somewhere in the fine print of that contract, they can do this legally. I mean, this, they're not doing this just to us. This isn't a letter to us. This is the letter that came from Kenworth for everybody who's buying trucks in that time frame. Right. Well, so think, I mean, I'm not saying they're right, but they must think they're right. Mm -hmm. Well, it just, I don't know. I, I don't see any of that fine language on this contract that, and I signed the contract. So I don't see any fine detailed anything. And, um, I only sent you the first, those two pages, but I've got the whole thing here and the rest of the contract just pretty much, um, line by line calls out the different parts on the truck. Um, oh, here's a pricing okay. disclaimer. Wait a minute. I found I'm, one. Glad to call, I'm glad to call them up and say, please, please send me over the language in the contract that allows you to make this price adjustment. Right, I just found something for a pricing disclaimer. So, uh, subject to, while we make every effort to maintain the website to preserve pricing accuracy, prices are subject to change without notice. So this is like pricing in the price list. Although the information in this price list is presented in good faith and believed to be correct at the time of printing, we make no representations or warranties as to the completeness or accuracy of this information. We reserve the right to change, delete, or otherwise modify the pricing information, which is represented within herein without any prior notice. We carefully check pricing specifications, but occasionally errors occur. So none of those, um, I mean, that's talking about how they put this on. Please check your order pre-bills to confirm your pricing information. Right. Yeah, that's not saying 
that that's, once that's the contract true. is signed, we right. can increase it. Right. Oh, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just telling you guys, I've had these contracts rubbed in my face before where they, where they have something in there. And I don't know if it's in there or not, but I don't mind calling them or Shane or Victor can call them and just say, hey, show us where in the, where in the contract it gives you the right to change the price. Do you know yep. anything anything about this, either Victor or Shane? Do you have any experience with this? Shane here? Yes. I just joined. Yeah. Up. Okay. Yeah, there's perfect. <laughs> there anything on uh, Dorinda's? I read the contract after uh, tonight, and it it says April twenty first, twenty twenty one, and then right over to the right it says one hundred percent complete. Right. I don't know. I that to me means one hundred percent, but I I don't know. I'm not a lawyer and uh, I'm not an insurance agent. And in the body of this letter, it says it's necessary to um, implement the pricing surcharge on. Um, it does say twenty twenty three MY trucks, but the HD and MD trucks may be canceled at no charge by March eighteen twenty twenty two. Um, surcharge will be applied to the chassis firm scheduled on or ap after April 1st, 2022. Well, we signed this long before that date. So I'm, I, I'm, I just wanted to throw it out there before you guys. Well, well here's, the, here's the problem. If, if we want to if we want to back out of this order, we can do it by April 18th. No harm, no foul. Except we need that truck. And I believe uh, Shane and Victor determined that the options to get other trucks are, are slim to none in the time frame we're looking at. I mean, can we order a truck and get one a year from now? Maybe we can. But uh, I think to get a truck in the time frame that we're talking about in that order, we can't. We can't do it, isn't that right, Shane? That's correct. Yeah, we cannot. No, no one has anything, and everyone's orders have been cut back. Unless an actual municipality has ordered a truck, or somebody has actually ordered one, they can't. The dealers can't get them just to have on the lot. So we would be looking at if we if we cancel this order and buy a truck from somebody else or, or try and order a different truck from them, we're going to be starting all over again with a horrendous lead time. Right. And I did read, I went through the specs after they, they finalized. Um, and I believe Dorinda signed the contract with the pricing for the price of the truck. But it doesn't say anything on that. But if you go through the whole spec list they sent afterwards on what the truck was going to be built, at the end of it, it said that they reserved the right to up the price at any time. Because yeah, I looked into it a little further. That's what I was. That's what I was afraid of, Dorinda. Well, then it's not on the signed contract. So no, that's what I said. I never saw it on that one, so I thought that was kind of odd that they did but supposedly according to one of the other dealers if they're calling it a surcharge because of stuff that's happened in the economy they can do it legally is what, what i was told them, and what prevents them from doing this again because we this is the second time they changed the price i would tell you nothing presents a prevent i hope they wouldn't but So we're going to we're going to take on this. I mean, it probably says somewhere in the contract, Dorinda, that the that the that the spec sheet is presumed to be a part of the contract. I would bet. I don't know. I'm I'm not a I'm not a lawyer. I, I, I'm not questioning it, but I just you know, if the shoe was on the other foot, we wouldn't have had the out, and it's it's kind of like they're holding us against the wall. Um. Right, yeah, I which agree. isn't right. We signed the contract in good faith. Our voters approved this money, um, and now you know we're faced with the surcharge. 
Uh, and I understand uh, we need the truck. I'm not saying yeah. we don't need the truck. And, you know, $5,000 isn't a lot, but it was 5000 just as we were about to sign the contract. Now it's another 5000 And that's just right. my point. No, and that's a valid point. Um, but I really, I don't think we want to wait and back off for a year because my feelings are, I think in the last year, less than a year's time, we have put almost 14,000 into that Western star. So, and I think the transmission started back funny again. Jay was complaining about it this weekend. I'm hoping it's just a fluke, but I really think we need to go forward with it as much as we don't want to. I'm hoping maybe the price of gas goes down. Will they drop the price? Maybe. I'm going to ask... Dustin tomorrow when I call him. Would you just, would you, Shan, if you're calling him tomorrow, would you, would you just ask him to send us over where in their contract it says they have the right to do this and see what his response is. Okay. All right. Then, and then get back to Dorenda and, and get back to me. I guess, I guess what I'm thinking we should do, and unless we can, convince them somehow that this doesn't apply to us is if we don't cancel the order, we get the, we get the price increase. And I would suggest they're not asking us to sign anything, right? They're just putting us on notice. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess ultimately if the truck comes and we refuse to pay for it, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what happens then. I don't want to, I don't want to think about that, but uh, I don't, if, if we go past, if we go past the 18, we have not lost the ability to cancel a contract, but we've lost the ability to cancel a contract without penalty, potentially. I don't think anybody, Peter, is saying to cancel the contract. I don't think anybody, any, I mean, it's obvious we can't. We have, a, like Shane says, we have a truck that's in dire straits, and now we have another one that's borderline dire straits. And uh, so we need the truck, but there's nothing. And, and so we'd get, I don't think we say anything. And what you alluded to is if there's anything, you got plenty of time. If you think that uh, you have a uh, grounds to, to stand on for not paying that, well then if, if that's what you. Well, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that, Victor. All I'm, all I'm saying is, you know, this is the time to ask them, show us, show us where it says. Oh, absolutely. Like absolutely. I'm not disagreeing with you a bit on that. Not a, not a bit. I'm just saying you, you almost, they got you over a barrel. You almost just got to kind of close, shut your mouth and uh, let it proceed. Hey, Shane, um, did they give you any indication on when they're actually starting to build the truck? It should be, it's this next quarter. So it could be anywhere from April to June, but the two slots that he had open when we committed were in April. So one of the questions that I would have is, okay, so if they can add this 5,000 in now and the language in the contract allows them to do that, and they're stating that they're doing it based on market conditions, if the market corrects itself, are they going to remove that surcharge? That's I, would what ask I'm... That, I would ask that question. Absolutely. I would tell you, so we have to... the rats chance is... they're going to remove that surcharge. But I, I agree. Man... I agree, Randy. It doesn't hurt to ask the question, but they're going to say they have no idea, you know, and they have no idea. I mean, this comes down from Kenworth corporate. This isn't this decision they're making in Burlington. No, no. And right. I, and I know that, exactly. but if, if, if at the point in time, and we may not know until it actually goes into production, but I would ask that is at the time of production, if there's market has corrected itself, is there a chance that this surcharge could be removed? I agree with right. everyone That's that we can't, we can't walk away from this truck. If we go find another truck, we're going to be paying what the market demands now anyway, which is probably going to be an increase of that 5,000 or more. Anyway. Um, but I think that just asking the questions to see if there is an out um, is appropriate. Yep. So are we going to, now we have to tell him by Friday. Is that what it was? March 18th. Yes, yeah. right. I, I think Victor's. Yeah. I think Victor's point is well taken. We're not going to turn down the truck no matter what. We're just pushing back on the surcharge. So, okay. you know, 
at least I think that's what we're what we're agreeing to. I I would hate to see us. Uh, I would hate to see us cancel the order. I think that's a mistake. Right. I don't think it makes sense. No. Mm -hmm. Do we know if our trading value is going to remain the same? Because we were quoted sixty thousand on that one. Um. It might it might actually go up if the market stays up, but they have a guy that's interested in it. Um, he's supposed to call me because he knows he can't get it till we get our new truck. Um, some guy owns his own company, and we might get more out of it if we sell it ourselves. So, how much more? I don't know. If what you maybe guys want to ask above, maybe we should tell him we've we've implemented a surcharge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should. I agree. I agree with the with the private sale of the truck because you know darn well, you know darn well. I mean, truck dealers are no different than car dealers or or farm equipment dealers. They give you a trade in value. They're going to sell it for more. They expect to make a profit when they sell it. So, right. Anyway, so I believe I believe what we're saying, and I want to make sure we're all in agreement is that we're going ahead with this truck, no matter what. We are going to question their right to do the surcharge and ask them for documentation. Uh, we're also going to ask the question if market conditions correct before we get delivery of the truck or they build the truck or whatever the right words are, is there any chance that the surcharge will be reduced? Uh -huh. And I guess the third, the third piece of this is to have Shane uh, pursue the private sale of the the private sale of our truck and see what that uh, looks like. Do we have any idea? Have we, have we looked to see, you know, I know, I mean, number one, trucks aren't as common as cars, but there are a lot of trucks that, that change hands. I mean, can we look and see what similar trucks have been selling for or going for at auction or anything like that? So we have some backup to know that the price is, uh, is right. Of course, that isn't going to include, that's just going to be the truck. That doesn't include any of the equipment which goes with the truck, which is substantial in value, I would think. And how and good of an indicator the uh, the state auction is. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what those go for. I know it's some are the the auction. Really cheap, but they're, they're pretty beat too. I, I don't know the answer to that. But I, but I think the, the one thing we do have the answer is we're, we're, we got a little homework to do, but we're, we're going ahead with the purchase of the truck. And when you ask these guys the questions tomorrow, Shane, I would not let them know that we're going to get the truck willy nilly. If they ask you if, you if we're canceling the order or not, just say we haven't determined that yet. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Mm -hmm. The minute we tell them we're getting the truck willy nilly, they're just going to say it is what it is. It'll be interesting to see what they come up with for uh, for um, a justification for this. But I'll I'll bet you somewhere they find that language in that contract, or find Probably. language that says that spec sheet is part of the contract. All right, okay. well, I'll put base them tomorrow. Okay. I'll be, uh, I may not be available in the morning, but I'll be available in the afternoon if you need to reach out to me. Okay. Anything else, boys, that we need to know about other than that the roads are uh, a little messy right now? They're not terrible. I mean, we can both pits, uh, Bickford's and Northeast open, so we can get material whenever now. Um, I'm thinking probably Thursday morning or Friday morning we'll end up fixing roads at least some spots depending on how deep the mud gets. But our roads overall aren't in bad shape in comparison with some other towns. So. Oh, I would agree. I would agree. They're they're very passable. You may have to slow down for the potholes, et cetera, but they're very passable. Right. Any questions, so, we'll, uh, board members? Anything I have else? one quick, one quick question. Should you guys make a motion on approving that money, um, the extra five thousand, or is that? I mean, because it was a motion of the amount you approved in the previous minute. So, should there be a motion on this? I don't think that it's you're a, approving it. Just to document 
what's going on. So it's in our minutes rather than just the general uh, general discussion. So is someone willing to make that motion that we accept uh, the $5,000 surcharge? I would make that motion to accept the $5,000 surcharge um, with notation that Shane's going to ask the questions that we outlined. Yep. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. Okay, thank you, Liz. So it's been moved and accept, uh, moved and seconded to accept uh, the surcharge, but to uh, push back on their authority to implement the surcharge. That sound right to everybody? Okay, all in, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I, unfortunately, I think it is it is what it is, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, anything else from the highway department? I don't think so. I don't know what you guys went over before I joined in. You guys must well, be running really you, early. Your timing was perfect. You arrived just when we started talking about the surcharge, so that was perfect. <laughs> no, we didn't no, have I Shane. What's that? We didn't have nope. anything else. No, I didn't have okay. anything else. Everything else is pretty decent, so. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh I uh Peter, I have a yeah. question for I have a question for them. Um and, and maybe the rest of the board. Um is the uh job posting uh have you guys been able to put that out for the remaining position? That's my bad. I haven't gotten to it yet. These uh, these meetings just came around too fast. I got to get it on the. Um, I have to get it. I've, maybe Vic can help me remember how to do this. Get it on the state site. But by tomorrow afternoon, it'll be done, Randy. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else, anyone? Okay then. Um. Addressing vacant lister and collector of delinquent tax positions of action possible. Uh, is this Sarah or Dorinda? Sarah can start with lister information. Okay. <laughs> this is why I haven't gotten around to posting on the uh, on the job on the highway department because spent all our time working on lister. So I've talked to BLCT. <clears throat> I've talked to Nemeric and I put it, this question out to the Comp 60 uh, board of listers. And the response is this, if we do not have any listers, which it may appear that we do not, the board can hire an assessor uh, and until the next town meeting, whereupon you can, if you so choose, put up the question, should we do away with elected listers and hire um, uh, an assessor who would be responsible to the select, who would report to the select board. The provision VLCT said the only caveat is that we make a big public effort about trying to get listers, um, advertising, posting, noticing from people who are uh, voters among town. That's one alternative. The second alternative is that we do get minimal listers. In other words, we get listers who can satisfy the statutory requirement of a board of listers. There would have to be two. And all they would have to do is sign the grand list when it's produced and attend grievance hearings. And Eric has said, yeah, he said yesterday he would be willing to do that. In that case, the town would have to hire somebody who would be kind of like a lister clerk. You could even be an appraiser. The appraiser wouldn't be responsible, wouldn't report to the select board. The appraiser would re report to this board of listers. And we already have an appraiser from Nemrick who is doing the field work. Uh, Chris Mealy from Nemrick called yesterday and contrary to what we had been informed uh, last year when we signed when you signed the contract to hire this professional appraiser, they are happy to do the multiple steps that between appraising properties and producing a grand list. And that includes, not to bore you, inputting property transfer tax returns into the NEMRIC program, uh, assessing current use, um, evaluating subdivisions, because when you have a subdivision, you, then property becomes different because they're going up to the highest and best use of each parcel, uh, dealing with the HS-122s, 
and also attending grievance hearings and doing stuff like, you know, help producing tax bills and that kind of thing. So there's been some interest from people who do this for a living. Uh, one man called today from Waitsfield who works for a couple of other towns and he, uh, he couldn't, I could not nail him down on a, on a figure, on a price, how much this would cost. He said, well, he, normally he does the whole thing that our, our the professional appraiser we have now is doing plus all the other uh, office work. So he, he didn't feel comfortable giving a price. I mean, I really tried to lean on him. Chris Mealy from uh, Nemerick said, yeah, we'll do it for $96 an hour. And uh, depending on what you need, uh, and uh, $47 drive time, though, of course, a lot of this can be remotely handled. So uh, that's that's where we are right now. And I guess the, the, the board needs to figure out what they what you want us to do. And we can do it. We can do a pursue two courses at the same time, which is widely as get, get the word out there. Like we need listers just to have a board of listers requires very little actual you know, knowledge at this time or else. Um, while also pursuing what we're going to need, which is a professional to come in and do that work. That's my spiel. Comments, anyone? Well, what? so the League of Cities and Towns wants this to be a position in the town right that's their preference as opposed to hire like why i'm just curious no i don't know the league of cities and town wasn't giving a preference either way league of cities and towns was saying okay you're if you have absolutely no one who is stepping up to be a lister and you, and you need at least two uh if you're you can hire an assessor but just you can hire an assessor until town meet next town meeting but just make sure you there's a lot of due notice there's a lot of public notice so that no one says hey the, the select board's grabbing all the power they're just getting an assessor you know i didn't know about yeah. this you want to make sure that's very transparent and very out there if you do hire if you do get you know a board of listers if we do a, if we have eric stays we get one more person who's just willing to attend the grievance hearings sign the grand list then we don't have to hire an appraiser. All you can though get a work around there is you can hire what's considered a lister clerk and they can come from anywhere and they can do the work. They will report to those two listers, not to the select board. Maybe you need to say, if we can't get someone from the town, we're gonna have to hire at a higher price and that's gonna cost us as taxpayers. So would someone like sure. to step up to the plate and <laughs> make some money at the same time? That's a good idea. What's the likelihood of getting a lister clerk? I, I think, you know, for example, Nemer can do the lister clerk job. Nemer can just, uh, they will, they'll, they can, you can add it onto their contract and they can do, they can just fill in the gaps from what they're doing. So in other words, when we were, when you guys signed that contract, you were told that this, like, and Nemerick's just going to do the out the field work. They're not going to do any of the office work. And that was my understanding as well. When I talked to Chris Mealy yesterday, he said, no, no, we'll, we'll do that as little or as much as you need. At $96 at, an hour. At $96 an hour. Right. Yeah. But you're not uh, going to find much less. Yeah. This is why I really wanted this other guy named Potter to give me like, he, he says, I operate by a flat fee and he could not give me a number. And that was kind of he frustrating. Said, what he said to me, Sarah, when I, and I didn't talk to him very long, but I talked to him briefly and he just said, I have to understand exactly what my responsibilities are going to be and try and figure out, you know, how much time that's going to take. And then I'll tell you what the, what the flat fee would be. He said, I don't, I've never worked with Nemerick. I don't know how that works. I don't know what, you know, so he was very, very willing to come up and meet with Eric, meet with you, meet with Dorinda, meet with me. Well, there are, others. there are others too. I've received other inquiries. So, I mean, right. that that's not going to be a problem. Duxbury, this is the model that Duxbury uses. Duxbury has like a couple of listers who barely do anything. And then they have a guy who does everything. So this is not an unusual model. Right. Sarah, is, is this guy that you're talking about, is he like an assessor? Would he, re could he potentially replace what Nemerick's doing now? Yeah. And well, not this year. We have a contract. Not this year. I, I explained to him we're in a one-year contract with Nimrick, but potentially he could do he could do the whole thing. And I I said, listen, I think we have. Am I am I right that we have about nine hundred parcels? Well, 
the, all, all those 900 parcels don't need to be addressed. They are, you know. Yeah. I was just trying to give him an idea of what the size of our town was and what the what the scope of it was. But anyway, he he is very interested in coming up and trying to figure out how to do this, or at least he appeared to be. Mm -hmm. And if there are other people, but I mean, the ideal scenario would be, I mean, I have to believe Nimrick is the Nimrick is the higher price spread. I don't know that that's true, but I find it hard to believe that this guy's going to charge us ninety six dollars an hour. Why would you not think that? I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, well, I don't know, Sarah. I, I don't know, but I mean, I know <laughs> part of this. Part of this is uh, part of this is about the money, and ninety six dollars an hour seems pretty high to me. But I could be wrong about that. I've been surprised before, but. I think I think we need to a keep trying to get people in town, but be ready to pull pull the trigger on these other options if we need to. And I would recommend that we have uh, I had his name right here, um, Spencer, uh, come up for a visit and sit down with Eric and maybe uh, maybe you, Sarah, and Dorinda, and and parse out and see how we could uh, you know what would it what would it be if if you took over, you know, everything but the inspections that Nimrick is doing, and what would it be after the Nimrick contract expires for you to take over the inspections as well? Well, I just want to be clear that I've got interest from other people as well. I mean, he is not well, the only talk, one. We should talk to them too before we pull the trigger. But I'm just saying until we until we have until we have numbers and, and options, uh, it's hard to know which way to go. But I think we have to be ready to say we might have to hire an outside person and to take the time to meet with those people, get pricing for them, understand what it is, I, I think is worth doing. And at the same time, keep pursuing, trying to get, uh, I mean, this clerks thing in, intrigues me because if what, if what Eric is really hating to do is the data entry part of this, and we have potential people who would be interested in doing that, then all we need is a second lister to to uh, work with Eric, and maybe Eric would stay. I don't know. He seems to change his mind with the with the weather. So I don't know. Can I, I just ask a on. question? Yeah. I thought it was really hard to find people like Nemrick. So this guy that's offering to do it is he? Does he do it for other towns? Could we get references and stuff like that? Yes, yeah. he does for Waitsfield, Hubbardton, Menden. And okay. uh, Fairhaven or New Haven. Or, uh, okay. New Haven. The mm -hmm. only the only thing that like worries me slightly is that like I was talking with a guy who works for one of these companies called like New England something or other. They do mm -hmm. this work as well, and they have like a five year waiting list for towns. And so if we were to like get rid of Nemrick, would we then be put down at the bottom of the waiting list to get back on? Because we're trying to save a few dollars. All good, all good questions. Yes, Dorinda. I'll also add that Nemrick, and I'm not supporting going either way. Nemrick, this is their system. I think there'll be a lot more time efficient trying to get this data. If they do, this guy doesn't use Nemrick, so them. And they will be changing the inner, they'll be changing uh, software next year. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of things that come into play here. Well, there are. I did not, I did not ask, uh, I did not ask Spencer if he worked with towns that have the, have the Nimric software i guess i would presume that he probably does but i don't know that i thought sarah but, said he wasn't familiar with it didn't you say he wasn't he, familiar he, he works with something uh, he said to me he works with something called microsol which he, which nemrick also uses so i said to him so you work with nemrick right and he said mm. so i don't know i mean it's gonna, obviously going to request a detailed conversation he's gonna i gave him uh eric's number and he can talk to eric and he th said that maybe he'll be able to have a um He'll have a, uh, a, a, a quote for us by Monday. But again, like VLCT says, it's, it's just best to uh, be extremely open and honest about this and try to get everyone in town, post notices, put it in the paper, put it on the website. And we have, I mean, and theoretically we have, we've mm -hmm. run an election, 
no one, there wasn't a big write-in campaign. I put stuff on front porch forum, but you know, we don't want anyone to accuse uh, the board of just kind of railroading this. Right. Now, I think we, we need to do those communications at least one more time. Um, and maybe as, as Liz said, uh, indicate that if we don't have people who come forward, we're, we're, we're gonna have to subcontract this. Mm-hmm. That might might scare scare up uh, a resident or two. I don't, I don't <laughs> is, is there any reason, there any reason we couldn't, uh, you know, just create a, a losing your post internet. on front porch forum and just take that same post and post it every week until while we go through proposals from other people as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't see why not. I mean. As long as you guys are open to that, uh, that's what I'll do. So the question is, do we go ahead, Dorinda, I'm sorry. The other thing you need to be concerned of, um, April 1st is two weeks away, and that is how the, pro- to, the grand list is created as of April 1st. So the person that's out there doing this, and again, I sound like I'm promoting Nemric, but I'm kind of playing the devil's advocate here. Are we smart to you know, go with the people we know who's using their own software, at least for this April 1st deadline. And then, you know, maybe look for down the road, how we want to move forward. Mm. Maybe. Uh, could we, could we set up an arrangement with them, uh, letting them know that we're, we're still looking for a different avenue moving forward and they can fill this in for the for the time being, would they be open to something like that? I, yes, sir. So when I, so when I talked to Chris, I mean, Chris Mealy from Nemrick, he, um, you know, what we've got is the really hard part of the job, or you know, even the fun part of the job is already being contracted by Nemrick, and all they're going to and and this Nemrick person is putting the data into the Nemrick system. So from my point of view, for this year at least, it would be almost more convenient to have Nemric just do the next step, which is using their programs, which aren't going to be available next year, to to create the grand list. That's all we're doing is just creating the grand list. That's, you know, it's 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 almost halfway done in some ways because we've had the successor working. But I mean, I'm sure they can work through this. I don't, I don't think that Nemrick is going to be very interested. I mean, they said it's sliding scale. So they said it's little as much as you want. You know, um, they also said they would provide training if we got somebody. So while if we, if we found somebody who was interested as a lister, while they're doing this 2022 process, they would be happy to train that person along with them, which I think is a benefit if we could find somebody because that would eliminate a lot of problems. That was not the impression I got from the guy who was calling from Waitsfield, but you know, that's not his job either. He wants to work completely remotely, by the way, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And that's to be expected. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the question is, I guess that what the question really comes down to is, you know, maybe what we need to do is say, okay, Eric, Eric does not want to do the grand list, right? Right. So we say, okay, Nimrick, we will hire you for the balance of the contract year that we've already done for the for the inspections. So, and your job will be uh, creating the grand list and dealing with uh, tax appeals. And if it's ninety six dollars an hour, it's ninety six dollars an hour. I mean, that should that shouldn't be that much time. It shouldn't be that much time. That's what I'm thinking as well. We have Dorinda says we've got twenty thousand dollars budgeted for listers. It shouldn't be that much time. And Eric doesn't think there's going to be a there's there going to be any uh, grievances because are you ready for this, guys? Here's the bomb drop. The grand list is not going to change based on sales from last year because apparently I did not know this. They don't just because of property transfers doesn't mean that the listers run out and then reappraise the property at the higher value for what it transferred. So we've so you've got a lot of houses that you know sold in the mid four hundreds 
that are still on the town's grand list at two at the 280, and they're going to stay there until we get our bad news from the state in December, and our CLA is you know in the 70 percentile. Whereupon we have to trigger a townwide reappraisal. Then we're going to need an, so, an assessor. So here's a question, though, Sarah, and I I got that message loud and clear from you earlier today, mm -hmm. but I have been involved in the purchase of probably 20 buildings in Montpelier over the years, including recent years. Mm -hmm. And every single time I buy a building in Montpelier, the first thing that happens is they up the appraisal on the building to the purchase price that I paid for. And they are not going through a full appraisal. It just happens. So I don't, I don't know. know. That's, that's what Eric I don't said. know whether that's, that's optional. I don't know what it is, but I can promise you, at least in Montpelier, they're, they're doing something which looks exactly like what you say they can't do, which doesn't make sense. I, I'm not, I mean, I it was my understanding that was the way it worked as well. And I don't understand it, but when I talk to PVR, um, uh, is, you know, Barb Schlesinger asked me, she said, well, it's not a reappraisal year for you. So you're going to, you're not going to have any grievances. So I, you know, I, I just don't, don't know you, enough I'm about sorry, listing. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but isn't it, isn't it true that at any time, for any reason, a, a lister can go out and reinspect a property and adjust an appraisal. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if there's some sort of fairness issue that, you know, if is, I don't know. I'm not a lister. I'm a town clerk. Well, neither am I. But, uh, but that, is, that is an interesting question because the point Dorinda brought up when we were talking about this in the office earlier is how come our grand list goes up so much if if uh, we're not increasing the appraisals on these on these uh, buildings, which sell for higher prices. I mean, if our, our grand list can't go up, if you can't change it, why does our grand list go up? Can't just be new construction. We don't have that much new construction. I don't know. I haven't had any lister training. <laughs> well, I, I would like I would like to get to get to the bottom of that issue. However, we do that. Maybe it's a question for Nemrick. I don't know. But maybe, maybe it is, it's an option for us to do that, but we don't have to do it. I don't know. I don't know. But something, uh, to, something doesn't pass us. Yeah, Phil. Just to bring this back around, um, and I, I think maybe I've, I've changed my thinking on this a little bit, that how are we going to proceed? Are we, we going to go out and look for at least one other person to join Eric so that we have a minimally functioning functioning board of listers and subcontract to Nemric because I, I think a lot of the arguments that I heard do make sense to stay that route. And with a uh, you know coming up to an April deadline, and I, and I know we lodge the grand list later on, but that it seems that may make sense. So I'm. That's the ease that that would be the most ideal if you guys could do that. If we could get just one other person to do that, that would be great. And then we would be then then all of this would go away. Okay. Until until next until August, where we're, the town the select board is going to have to think about how to pursue assessing from there on from that okay. point forward. But I'm going to suggest that's what we do for now. Okay. So so Phil, what you're saying, just to be clear, is that we do hire Nimrit to create the grand list, but at the yep. same time, we keep trying to, we keep trying to recruit another lister. I mean, it'll be, you know, it'll be <laughs> the months, the months go by pretty fast. So, sure yeah. you know, I think the, I think, I think we're stuck with hiring Nimrit to do the mm -hmm. grand list and the appeals for this year. And we just hope it doesn't amount to very many right. hours. It doesn't amount to much money. Right. And I think we're likely to be able to find one or two people who would be willing to do this kind of sit on a board and uh, do appeals and that kind of thing without having the responsibility of the, 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 the full range of what a lister does. Um, and at least maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, answer, exactly. The answer is who knows, but for some reason, for some reason, uh, and, and I can understand, but there, there's some aspects. I don't, I don't understand why apparently creating the grand list seems to be a big bugaboo. I mean, to me, that's an administrative, relatively simple process, but there must be some part of it that I don't understand because Eric is just bound and determined that he doesn't want to be involved in it. And I don't understand why. 
I, I honestly don't think it's that bad. I think that he doesn't want to put the, I don't, I don't think he wants to input the property transfer tax returns. If he teaches me how to do it once, I can do it. I record all the property transfer tax returns. It's not going to cost me anything, any more time to do it, to just put them into Nembrick. So, and I said, talked about that with Chris Mealy. He said, I said, can I do that? He said, sure, you can, that's easy. But I, what I can't do is a town clerk is assess the value of, of uh, subdivisions. But I think that's partly what Marla is doing for Nemerick right now. So, I mean, I think a lot of it mm. is not that much. Like the HS 122s and uploading and downloading those. And uh, I think it's a lot of bureaucratic filing with the state from what I can tell. It doesn't seem like it's really complicated. It's just, you know, you got to file your 411, you got to file it by a certain time. Mm -hmm. And you have to be a watchdog on these HS 122s, which is just a pain in the butt. Yeah. Well, I think we need to make I think we need to make a decision. So my recommendation would be that we agree to hire uh, Nimric to do the uh, grand list and the tax appeals for this year uh, and handle that for the term of their existing contract. And then we'll review whether we renew that, whether we have been able to recruit people, whatever as time goes by here. But for right now, I think we need to put them on the hook and get them, get them working. And I also think uh, by doing that, uh, the likelihood of, of uh, Eric sticking around a little longer is, is a lot better. You yeah, just maybe. need one other person, one other person. That's one it. Other. Yeah. Does, does Nimrick's existing contract run through June 30? I don't know. Um, I think it was uh, to do, I don't know if there was an actual date for it. It was to do all of the appraisals that for needed to be done for, for 2022 tax year. So yeah. more of a scope of work. A scope work of work as time. opposed to yeah. from this date to I this think. day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but maybe, maybe what we say to Nimrick is we will hire them to lodge the grand list and go through the tax appeals whenever they, whenever they are for this year's work let's if we, get a, if we get a board of listers then that's then they don't have to worry about that you right. know, that then it's out of the select board's hair right but all, all i'm saying is <laughs> what are we going to ask nimerick to do what we're going to ask them to do is do the grand list and deal with the tax appeals for this year's tax season right that sound right to everyone should Somebody we want to make that motion? I, 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 Eric, should we talk to Eric first and see exactly what he wants them to do? And before we, I, I think what we should do is, if you have a board of listers, then then the then the board of listers can technically hire Nemric, and that's probably the right way to do it. Otherwise, you guys are just basically hiring an assessor. You know what I mean? Yeah, but we don't have a board of listers. But my, maybe by uh, April 5th, we will. So all you, if okay. you, if you appoint no, but, I, but I'm just, but I'm just you, you I don't know. This maybe, we, maybe we wait and see if we can, if, see if we can get somebody. I mean, the, the, the work on the grand list begins as of April 1st, but it isn't completed until June, right? Well, and it's already no, begun. A lot. And, the, and the work has already begun. Marla has already begun the work. So uh, I think what, if I say to Chris, look, we're going to try to get a, uh, uh, one more person and they would be appointed by April 5th and the board would like to hire you to do all of this, then we could just, you know, bring it back to you on April 5th. You guys can ratify it and go forward. How about, hey, how, about how about I have a conversation like that with Chris? Does that make sense? Yep. Well, before we take any formal motions, that makes it looks like the select board's hiring an assessor. That's my only concern. Because I'm trying, I'm trying to follow VLCT's advice about this. No, I, that's good. So, so but we've we're already hired an assessor, haven't we've already hired an assessor when but we have them to do the appraisals. So all we're doing is adding to their scope of work. Well, that's maybe one thing. Yeah. But we don't I don't I think you're right. I think we don't need to pull a trigger on this until April 5th. So maybe Just after that. If you guys can think of anyone. Find, let's see if we can find another person in the meantime. So Meanwhile, I'll, I'll talk to Nemrick and just tell them what, what's going on. They understand our situation. And, uh, and, I'll, and, and maybe Eric can talk to him and try to get a ballpark, how much it's going to cost. Okay. 
that work for everyone? I, yes. I think I just have I have one other question uh, before we move on. Is Nemerick's contract with the select board? Is it with the listers? Is it with the town? How is that differentiated at all? That's a good question because there seems it, it to be would, two different interpretations. <laughs> well, I would imagine it's with the, the contract, town of Middlesex. You the contract, Orinda, right? Huh? You signed the contract? No, I don't recall signing the contract. I wouldn't the have power to do that, I don't think. I'm the wondering listers, if maybe it is I'm, the listers. That's what I was thinking. That's why I'm holding off because that's the listers did sign the contract. They were very adamant about that, but you as the right. bursers had to release the money. So you approved the money and the, the contract is with, is the lister signed the contract, but I believe the contract is with the town. The contract's with the town and the oh. agreement, I believe was signed by the listers. That's right. Yeah. I have a copy. Okay. okay. Technically they report to the listers, not the select board. Right. That's correct. Right. Yeah. It gives me a headache. I know. It gives me a headache. <laughs> must be almost must be almost cocktail time. It's got to be. <laughs> um, so are we all set on that for tonight? I think we are. Yeah. Okay. So we've just got a few uh, few quick uh, quick things to deal with here. Wait a minute. We skipped uh, over delinquent tax collector on the same oh, item geez. number. <laughs> we missed it last time, and we're not going to miss it this time. <laughs> Memrec want to do that job too? <laughs> might might I suggest that as we post uh, information about the Lister situation that we also include this delinquent yeah. tax? I agree. Yeah. We need to yeah. put, on, we put on a full court dress to find somebody, definitely. Yeah. I don't see anyone raising their hand. Uh, just, board cannot, 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 cannot. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just teasing. But I mean, we need to. I agree with the idea of just keeping it on front porch forum, getting it on, getting it on wherever we can get it, and keep it on there until we get somebody. I mean, we're now, we're now potentially paying, paying real money for this job. It's not a peanuts job anymore. So. During right. a, a, it, one thing I'd like to get into the record is that the collector of delinquent taxes in some towns does it soup to nuts. But in, in our town, you know, uh, Cheryl sends out notices, right, the, to let people well, know that. Uh, I volunteered to do that. Uh, when I was the de delinquent tax collector, collector of delinquent taxes, I'm the one who processed all the letters and contacted all the people. All we've been doing is, which I volunteered our department to do in the interim, is send out the late notices. Um, so, and we'll continue to do that until we find somebody, but there's nobody really reviewing these notices. Um, right now, I think we're okay um, until the end of when the last tax payment is due. And then I think by that time, it will be important for somebody to go through the list to see who didn't pay their taxes for the current year. All right. Well, yeah. let's, put the, let's put the full court press on to try and find somebody. And I don't know what, I do not know legally what the fallback is if we have nobody. Do you know, Dorinda? Um, I think it just says that you need to appoint somebody uh, is, I think that's what the language was. I haven't looked at it in a while, but if no one's in the office, you're supposed to appoint somebody. Right. And there's no volunteers to appoint. That's the whole problem we're having. Right. So I think, you know, I think you're, you know, if, it comes down to the legality of appointing someone, then certainly we can appoint, you know, I don't care if I get appointed, but I just want it clear that this is not the job that I'm taking on. You know, I'm kind of holding it together, but it's nothing to go forward with. Well, I, I have a I have a I have a funny little nervous tick in the back of my brain is that if we don't have anybody, the responsibility reverts to the select board. But it does not. Know. You're the con. That's the conflict that you cannot. You. I checked. I checked yesterday. Can you select board members may not be collectors of delinquent taxes, nor may they be treasurers. 
all I'm all I'm saying is, you know, just like with this Lister thing, there's got to be some kind of fallback because, again, we're not the we're not the first town that's had this issue as well. So let's let's put the full court press on to advertise and see if we can't wrestle somebody up. And at the same time, I guess Sarah, if you would just add to your list asking the League of Cities and Towns, what do we do if we can't find a delinquent tax collector? What happens then? Well, I did ask them today. And what did they say? It's the treasurer. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Oh, you were keeping that quiet, weren't you? <laughs> It's not, well, it's been a long meeting. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Dorinda, 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 maybe, you, maybe you better have that first cocktail right now, Dorinda. Uh, no, let's try, in all seriousness, let's, let's, try and, let's try and find somebody. I mean, as, as much as it can be a little bit of a, challenge, a challenging job, it's not, it's not that uh, horrendous. I just, as Dorinda, I believe, said when we were first talking about this, it's important to have somebody who can make creative deals with people, try and be, you know, absolutely be fair to people. And, you know, you got to do what you got to do, but do it in the nicest possible way. I mean, yeah. the personality of the person who takes this job is as important as anything. I think. So, okay. Done for tonight. Congratulations, Dorinda. No. <laughs> really. Okay, moving right along. I'm I'm going to suggest we've we've kept uh, we've kept Sky in the waiting room for quite a while here. So I guess uh, I, I would suggest that we we bring her up, other business up to the up to the top of the line. If that everybody agrees with that. Yeah. So Sky, you're on. Hello. Welcome. I'm sorry we kept you waiting so long. That's okay. That's okay. Appreciate you. Do you want to be the tax collector? Yeah. <laughs> we say yes to this. Would you be the tax collector? Um, my internet seems to be cutting out. I didn't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Sorry. We're just. We're just. Okay. So oh. I. Um, so. Um, ever since the pandemic in the summer, I've been trying to hold some of my fitness classes outdoors just because that makes people feel more comfortable. And I was wondering if it would be possible to hold them at the bandstand. Um, I do one a week and I had previously been hosting them at um, Camp Mead. And I just think the bandstand would be a more central location for Middlesex residents. Um, so I just want to see if that was a possibility. So what is it's once a week for how long? I mean, how many hours or, um, usually I go from like May through August. It depends on how the turnout is. Um, sometimes it trails off, you know, when school picks back up, it gets harder for people. Um, but usually like Memorial day to labor day is kind of the rough timeline. Yep. And how, and how long are the classes? Um, usually like around 40 minutes. I mean, I can adjust them. They could be a ha anywhere from a half an hour to an hour, but 40 minutes or 45 minutes seems to be a good length. So you would basically just be using the field. You wouldn't be using the bandstand, correct? Right, right. Yeah, just that area outside. Sounds like Peter wants to join your class. He's mm -hmm. asking a lot of questions. Exactly. I'm sorry, what is it, yoga? I, can't, I forget what it said on the thing. Um, no, it's more like, a, it's like a moderate intensity. So I bring like dumbbells and resistance bands. It's a lot of body weight movements, like planks, squats, um, lunges. Huh. Um, we, you know, modifications for all levels. So we try to be, have something for everybody, whether they're just starting out or they want to like get a, a really intense workout. Um, is this your own, like, is this the Alpen Glow or is this you personally doing it uh, as your own little business? I do it through Alpen Glow because that's where my insurance is. And that's okay. how I have like my registration. Um, just to be like totally honest, Alpen Glow is like, is struggling a lot. It's been a rough two years. So the outdoor classes are just like, a, a, it's good for the community. And it's good for us because it helps us bring in a little bit more revenue to help pay the bills. 
um, because indoor indoor fitness classes have not been a real success during the pandemic. Um, So yeah, it's it's just me that teaches them, but it is under the Alpen Glow business. So I guess I guess the question is, and I'm just throwing it out to the select board. That sounds like sounds like a pretty pretty minor uh, pretty minor thing, but I would I would just say in the past when we have allowed businesses, whether they're town residents or outside businesses, to use our facilities, whether it's using the town hall or a field or whatever, we've charged some kind of a fee, and we required a certificate of insurance. I don't know what what the appropriate fee would be. Um, it sounds like it sounds like you have insurance, so that it, that answers that uh, question. And presumably, you could add the town to your to your or or get your insurance broker to issue a certificate of insurance for the benefit of the town. But I don't know I how others, I don't know how others uh, others feel about that. What do we what have we charged other entities in the past, Peter? Is there a, is there a fee structure? Is it based on the event? The only the only fee structure that I'm aware of is we we did have a fee structure for the town hall. And it was it was what Sarah pretty small, right? It was like twenty five bucks for a day. Yeah, for a whole day. I can share. Um, so at Camp Mead, I pay two dollars a person, which is great because if I have nobody show up, I have no revenue. Um, the other structure I thought about was if I didn't pay a per student fee, but offered a discount for Middlesex residents, like ten dollars if you're a Middlesex resident, sixteen if you're not, something like that. Um, kind of like a recreation department set up. Yeah. I, I, how many people do you generally have? Um, anywhere from like four to eight. Hopefully more you know if we're in think, a more prominent location. <laughs> yeah. I, I would think, I would think $2 a person or something like that. And we operate on the honor system would be, uh, would be fair. Um, I think it's the principle of the thing more than the amount of money involved. This isn't going to help us renovate the town hall and stream of revenue, um, but maybe it'll pay to cut the grass at the bandstand a couple of times or or something like that. Who knows? But I don't know. I recommend that maybe the money goes here. to the bandstand committee, like something that's if it, if you know because if it's raining, are you going to be like dancing on the bandstand? No. <laughs> I mean, if it's raining, we usually cancel. Okay. All yeah. All would say. Sarah is Sarah Liz is remember we're paying to mow the bandstand. Oh right, so it, yeah. Some justification in terms of us collecting. Okay, yeah, the yeah. Band. And they're not going to use the bandstand itself; they're just going to use the field. Yes, Dorinda. Um, if we are chi- charging, is there any issue with liability? If we're charging to do this and somebody gets hurt or falls or falls in the ditch. Um, if we're charging for the, for this, they, I might come back to us. So that's my only question on that. What, is I would, there... what, I would, what I would tell you is if we allow anybody to use any of our town facilities for any reason, we have some liability exposure, but that's why it's important for the vendor to have their own insurance because they're going to be at the head of the line. Okay. So, uh, that's why I asked, that's why I asked that question. I mean, yeah. anything anything that happens in any or around any of our facilities, we're potentially liable if somebody slips and falls or, or who knows what happens. Right. So. But we're not charging for it. I mean, if we're holding, you know, like the, normally we're not holding charging for the venue. So that's why I was just wondering. I, I to be honest with you, I don't think it makes any difference to Okay. That's, that's a quick, if that's a, a serious concern i think we should we should ask our insurance. no i didn't i thought maybe you would know be coming from the insurance world. well that's what I'm, I'm giving you my i'm giving you my answer but you know what uh you know what free advice is worth right <laughs> i'm just i'm just telling you in my in my 44 years of insurance experience the way it goes is whether you have a building or a field or anything if someone's using that whether or not they're paying you for it um you have some liability exposure somebody gets hurt yeah are they are they likely to name the town yes are we likely to be liable i mean the the other thing we have is 
there, there's pretty good law saying that, you know, you can't, it's very difficult to go after the town for something like that, even if when it happens on a town road. So anyway, I'm not, I'm not particularly concerned about that. And as I said, I just think the principle of when it's a business, I mean, if this was a volunteer activity and, and Sky was just doing this with some of her neighbors for, for fun, I would say, you know, maybe it's just okay and we don't do anything. But when it's a business and we're going to require a certificate of insurance, I think it makes sense to have some kind of a fee. And uh, the, the $2 a head thing seems, seems fair to me if that works for you, Sky. And, and again, I don't know how everybody else feels about it. Maybe you yeah, think it's more or less. Whatever. I think I think it makes sense. It 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 limits her risk of having nobody show up and having to pay a fee. And um, yeah. I I agree with you. It's the principle behind it. Um, so the two dollars a head thing, if if that's currently you know what she's comfortable with in their in her current arrangement, it seems to carry through here and and limits her exposure um, to paying for something when nobody comes. So I I like it. Me too. And I would say it would make probably most sense from a um, financial standpoint to just do it at the end of the season. You pay it at the end of the season or something like that, if that makes the most sense. Oh, yeah. To oh, yeah. Just keep track. Just keep track of the numbers. And what we should what we should do, the other the other part of this is we should just uh, write up a simple agreement uh, that that we sign and you sign Sky, which says, you know, you have the ability to use the bandstand up to an hour a week from Memorial Day to Labor Day or whatever you want to say. And we agree that the fee will be two dollars per participant and per class and that you will provide the town of Middlesex with a certificate of insurance. Yes, Randy. I think the only thing that I have a question about is whether or not the times are, are um, you know, consistent and um if if we need to put any consideration in the other events that are happening and you know who's got priority of of different types of events so i don't know if you're just kind of scattered with the schedule depending on people's availabilities or is this a monday at 9 a.m every week type of thing yeah i was thinking either thursday or friday mornings at seven or eight um I, I might do like a survey and see what works best for the most amount of people, but it would be like the same time every week. And I wouldn't think at that, at that time of the day that we've got people lining up to use the bandstand, do we? No. <laughs> I just think, I just think we think it sounds like a nice thing. Um, yeah. I think, I think we should do it. Just, you know, and, and I guess the other thing that should be in our agreement is that you agree to, you know, leave the field in the same condition you found it. Don't leave trash. Don't, you know, <laughs> don't make a mess, basically. Right? Nobody fall in the ditch and nobody litter. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you bring, take it back. So, so Sarah, if you could, if you could just draw up a simple, simple agreement. Yep. Just Sounds covering great. those covering those items and sky look it over and if you agree you sign it we'll sign it and uh you're off to the races and i'll see you all there at our first class uh last yes. day. So okay. i will i will say if victor and dorinda show up at the class i'll show up <laughs> they're a lot of fun i will say and maybe i should include randy yeah, I, in that. I don't know phil yeah. who knows anyway Good Great, for well, you. thank you so much. It's a nice thing. Well, I'm sorry we kept you waiting so long. Hi, okay. I'm sending you an email about a um, micro business grant opportunity that you may not know about. Oh, uh, thank you. Keep businesses alive. <laughs> I, I need all the help we can get. It's been rough. So just oh, look well. for your um, your email. I'm sending it from my Gmail. Okay, thanks, Liz. Yep. All right, uh, thanks, y'all. Have a great night. Okay. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Um, approving the minutes of the March 8th, 2022 select board meeting is our motion. So moved. Second. I will. Randy, thank you. It's been moved and seconded to approve the uh, minutes of the March 8th select board meeting. All those in favor, say aye, aye. please. Aye. Wake up, Liz. I said aye. 
<laughs> but I started to doubt if I was at the meeting, but this was just last meeting and I was. So. Just, just, just stay awake, Liz. Um, okay, we've approved our minutes. Uh, reviewing and approving the class one and class three liquor license renewals for the filling station action likely. And uh, we got copies of the, uh, of right. the application, pretty straightforward. I don't believe we've had any issues with them, which would cause us not to renew this license. I'm in approval. Okay. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve the class one and class three liquor license for the filling station. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we've done that. We've talked to Sky. Uh, we have orders orders to sign. Did you get signatures to render? Are you still sure? Uh, when I left the office today, I had just yours. Okay, I'll be done tomorrow. Can you also, so everybody should sign the liquor licenses. I'll leave you out there with little sticky things. Okay. I can stop by tomorrow afternoon. How many, how many signatures do you leave need on the uh, liquor license? Three? Oh, that would be ideal. Yeah, the this, the DLC has been pretty understanding with pan with the pandemic, but they're getting less and less so. So, well, if so it's Randy, you'll go and I can, can skip stop out. by. It's just I saw I was stopped by today. I, I I love seeing you, but I don't need to be there every day. Well, three would be really nice since okay. we're not going to have Steve, and since it's hard for Liz, so it'd be Randy, Phil, and you. That would be great. Randy, what road All do right. you live on? McCullough Hill. Know that I'm over. I'm neighbors with Steve and Phil. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you live on McCullough Hill too. What no power triangle down, down here. <laughs> I thought you lived on Brook Road, Phil. I do, but oh, McCullough's just. You mean like the way they join? Oh, it's right up yeah. the right up, yeah. the, right up the hill. <laughs> so you are you on the other side of where Susan Clark lives and Susan Warren? They live on the other end. Randy, are you? On the I'm other end? I'm Mine. all the way at the end by Center Road. I see. Okay. Cool. Correspondence. And Dicklet's on McCullough Road too. Yeah, only the only the oddballs live on the other side of the hill, Liz. <laughs> Wait, Dorinda, you live on McCullough Hill too? Just below McCullough Hill. Instead of turning up the hill, you just keep going straight. He's oh, in my really? Backyard. Are that new houses? Right across the street. Yeah. That house, my goodness. Who's this? All right, Liz, behave yourself. Yeah. My brother in law's. <laughs> really? Is it a seasonal house? Oh my God, Liz. <laughs> I've never seen that house till just recently. It's really cool. Yeah. Beautiful. Liz, I wouldn't want to fall off the back. Liz Sharp, <laughs> are you are you starting to take over the habits of a former select person who shall go nameless? What am I being a little Not forgetful? Personal stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just I I noticed that house for the first time. It Orca. Orca. <laughs> I'm just curious. It's just a house in Middlesex. Okay, okay, okay. We're good. Correspondence. <laughs> Sarah. No. There's no correspondence. Okay. okay. I've sent I've sent everything. Okay, so you all have next week off. Congratulations. Wow. Guys, I just I screwed up tonight. I forgot to invite the fire department. I was wondering about that, but I didn't say anything. No, they didn't what? have anything to report anyway. Scott came on, but he left. Oh. Scott Isham, he was on here earlier and then he yeah. left. I got a note I from Jeff. Sign on. He will. He's happy to send you his report, even though I uh, I spaced on it. Well, let, that's okay. Why don't you just send him a little note of apology and ask him to come to the next meeting if you can. Okay. I think it's good to see him. I don't, I don't want to. I don't know. I, I just, I, I honestly, know. I forgot. I just, I, I don't before know. If, you we, know. Before we go, should we schedule what you're going to discuss at the next meeting? Like, are we going to take up ARPA stuff? Or are we going to do, how soon are we going to start talking about any of those items? Well, I think the two the two big items are are uh, starting to talk about how we're going to go forward on the fire department issue, and I agree the ARPA funds thing we, we need to dig into. So, I guess I I think I think maybe what we need to do, and I know 
I know you're going to groan when I say a special meeting, but I think maybe we need to schedule a meeting just to talk about the ARPA situation. I don't know how everybody else feels. I agree that, with that. That's a complicated, it's a complicated yeah. issue. And we've got to figure out some kind of structure and plan on how we're, you know, once, once the word gets out that, that virtually anything is, uh, is eligible. And I, I went back and read through that stuff and they, it isn't exactly crystal clear, but they say exactly what you what you said, Dorinda. So, I guess we have to take that for what it is, unless they change the guidance. But I'm just afraid the floodgates are going to open. Everybody's everybody's going to want some of that money, and I think we have to be uh, we have to be careful how we deal with it. So, I'm not suggesting that the that the April fifth meeting be the special meeting for that. I think we need to set it at a separate uh, a separate time. So. Let's take let's take one week off. Let's invite the fire department to the uh, to the April fifth meeting, and then consider setting up a special meeting after that to deal with uh, to deal with or start dealing with with ARPA. I, I would also challenge all of you to think about as much as much as we say we want to make it a public process. Um, do we want to come up with some kind of a laundry list of, of suggested uses and then have a public meeting? Do we want to have a public meeting and have it be a, a free for all? I don't uh, No. I don't know. I, I think that we should come up with a list and present that list and then open it up for public comment and suggestions for any other ideas, maybe. I think that's fine, Randy. Yeah. We, we need to keep track of what I want to be sure we keep track of is is the timeline on that um, matching grant for the fiber because it would be a shame if if our intent is to give them some of that money, we should certainly give it to it give it to them when it can be matched. It would be a mistake to miss that opportunity. Right. When do we think that is, Phil? Do you know? I believe it's September first, but I can call um, Jerry uh, Diamatides, who's the new new chair, and double check with him. Okay, it would just be great to know what that date is. Yeah. I mean, I think we've got time, but you know, as I say, the, the weeks and the months roll by pretty, uh, right. pretty fast. And and Dorinda, we expect to get the second slug of that money in the June time frame. Is that right? Uh yeah, I think so. Um, let's see, is there a date? Uh, this doesn't say exactly when, but yeah, I think so. I mean, roughly in that time frame. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was just, half now and then half towards this summer or somewhere. Yeah, that was my I'll recollection. Look, I'll look it up, but um, yeah, I think one fell for the, like one year and then they were spacing it. The next one was in the following yeah. physical year or something. Yeah, right. Right. That sounds right to me. Yeah. Um, I always think riding up the the. Uh, mud on east hill today i was thinking it'd be nice to pave from the uh montpelier city line right up right up past my house <laughs> maybe we should invest in some animal fencing <laughs> electric fence I just, yes sarah i just want to tell you that i'm not going to be here for that first tuesday of the may of the may meeting i'm actually going to go to poland so oh my god yeah, tickets are purchased. So that's oh, goody. Yeah. I'm it's going crazy. in June. There if go. there's no war. Well, as long as you come back. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. It would be very nice to arrange for arrange for peace over there before you go. Yeah. yeah I don't know what's gonna happen, but I but that's so if you're thinking of special meetings, I won't be here to take minutes for them. And do when are you it. actually gone, Sarah? Do you want to divulge that? I'm going Monday, May 2nd and returning Monday, May 9th. Okay. And I will be tired. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, well, we're not expecting that. We just, that, just so. I can take I minutes. I can take minutes. Hmm? I'll take minutes. Well, we can work. We can work around that. And also the yeah. meeting is recorded if push comes to shove. So. Yeah.